Wow. Now, finally, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers for this evening. First, Ruben Christie is a solid leader with over 25 years in corporate America, leading global teams focused on operational effectiveness and disciplined approaches to financial management. He is a proven change agent and an excellent analytical, organizational, and problem solving skills. He's also a strong communicator with the ability to build trust and teamwork across all levels within an organization while providing innovative solutions to complex business problems. He has held key leadership positions for major corporations like General Electric, McGraw Hill, and Suez Corporation. In addition, he's a former board member of the African American Museum of Bucks County, where he designed and implemented a pop-up museum used to reach and educate over 1,000 students in the Bucks County school system on the contributions of African Americans in our U.S. history. Recently, he partnered with the, w, with the YWCA and United Way of Bucks County to deliver a simulation workshop of the historical U.S. policies that contributed to the racial wealth gap between Blacks and Whites. Ruben has a degree in engineering from Rochester Institute of Technology and an MBA from the University of Pennsylvania Wharton School of Business. He currently resides in PA with his wife and three children. Welcome, Ruben. Are you there? I'm going to conjure you from the internet. I am. Thank you, Matt, for that uh, wonderful introduction. <laughs> Thank you. Happy to be here. Fantastic. All right. Next, Laura Turner Igo is the curator of American art at the James A. Michener Art Museum in Doylestown, Pennsylvania. She has held curatorial and research positions at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, Princeton University Art Museum, Harvard Art Museums, and the Barnes Foundation. Laura is the co-editor of A Green Country Town, Philadelphia's Ecology in the Cultural Imagination, and she has contributed essays to the journals American Art, Panorama, Commonplace, and the exhibition catalog Nature's Nation, American Art and Environment. At the Missioner, she curated Impressionism to Modernism, the Lenfest Collection of American Art in 2019, and Rising Tides, Contemporary Art and Ecology of Water in 2020, and is the co-curator of the current exhibition, Through the Lens, Modern Photography in Delaware Valley. Welcome, Laura. Thanks, Matt. Very happy to be here. Last, we have Marlene Prey, M-E-D, uses she, her, hers pronouns, and is a community organizer, sexuality educator, trainer, and an anti-racist activist. She is one of the leaders of Rise Up Doylestown and is the founder and director of Planned Parenthood's Rainbow Room, now in its 19th year as Bucks County Center for LGBTQ plus youth. She serves on the executive committee as public outreach coordinator for the Bucks County NAACP, and was elected in 2011 to serve as a councilwoman on the Doylestown Borough Council, where she led the community effort to pass Doylestown's LGBT inclusive anti-discrimination anti ordinance. She has been recognized regionally and internationally for her advocacy, leadership, and organizing efforts for reproductive, social, and racial justice. Marlene is also a mother, sister, earth-based priestess, and lover of birds, bees, funky music, vegan food, smashing the patriarchy, and cats. <laughs> Marlene, welcome. Thank you. Hello, everybody. All right. With that, I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Laura. All right. Thanks, Matt. Let's get going. I'm going to share my screen. and introduce you to our current exhibition, Essential Work 2020, A Community Portrait. So this exhibition came about because like a lot of institutions, um, we at the Michener have wondered how we could respond to or be engaged with the events of this past year. Um, we wanted to find a way to connect with our community during a challenging time and also provide a moment or a space for reflection. 
And also I had become interested in these phrases that just became part of our language this past year, things that we had never really said before and now say all the time. So things like essential work, um, social distancing, stay at home, um, all these you know, phrases that have entered our vocabulary um, and essential work is certainly one of them. And I, I just found it such a kind of you know, evocative phrase and one that can be interpreted in many different ways. So we asked the Bucks County, Philadelphia and greater Delaware Valley community to send us photos capturing what work was essential to them in 2020. And we received over 200 submissions. And together with Ruben and Marlene, uh, we selected 25 finalists whose photographs were printed, framed and displayed in the gallery. Photographers were awarded year long memberships to the museum and they will receive uh, their framed photograph after the exhibition closes. And we also have about 30 additional submissions that we are um, displaying in a slideshow within the exhibition too. And I should also mention that all the uh, photographs have labels written by the photographers themselves. So you really get um, an insider's view or perspective of, of the images. So these images really captured a variety of perspectives on essential work, everything from remote schooling to protests for social justice to intimate moments of togetherness and connections during this you know, unprecedented year. And the exhibition also features a community wall where visitors can record and share their thoughts about what work is essential to them going forward. So essential to them this year in 2021. And I took these photos of the board when I was in um, this Monday, the museum's closed on Monday, but I was gathering up um, the, uh, the responses that were posted on the board this weekend to be archived and was just, you know, a lot of really, you know, powerful messages have been left by visitors. And I'm also gonna share just a little bit about um, our work at the Michener this past year, it's like a lot of museums, it's been, you know, a, a period of upheaval and change. And I just thought I'd talk about some, you know, some ways that we've adapted and are continuing to adapt and questions we continue to ask and face going forward. So many of you might know um, that the Michener, you know, it's closed um, from mid-March until the end of July. And then also again, over the winter holidays. And I'm showing you this image here um, this was the last day we were in the museum um, in March and right before we decided we were going to close for two weeks, little did we know. We were in the middle of installing a major exhibition uh, called Rising Tides, Contemporary Art and the Ecology of Water. So we had artwork up in the galleries. Um, we received notice that we were going to close and we, you know, I suspected it would be longer perhaps than two weeks. So everything went back down into storage. But it's always sad when you're, you know, right in the middle of putting something up for people to appreciate and then having to pause for several months. <laughs> and especially there were seven contemporary artists in this exhibition and they were incredibly flexible and understanding through this whole process. So we, we I really felt like we weathered the storm uh, together. So this question, you know, once we were closed, how do we adapt and stay relevant and connected um, was one that we were continually asking ourselves as staff. One way is to kind of become more playful, you know, and I think you all might have seen these uh, these challenges on social media to recreate your favorite artworks using items at home. So I was playing with my kids. I have two young kids and um, thinking about the art that I couldn't see in person at the time, like Fern Coppage's back road to Pipersville on the left and the Michener's collection and recreating it with uh, Duplo blocks and pillows. <laughs> And here's another favorite from the Michener's collection, uh, Clarence Carter's Over and Above um, Fox from 1963. My daughter recreating that um, at home. Because as many uh, working from home parents know in the early pandemic, you were balancing, you were all balancing childcare and working at the same time, trying to keep things creative. We also produce tons of uh, content, um, virtual programs. Matt and I have been, we, Matt was saying before this program started that we've, we've done probably like 400 programs together over the past year. Um, if you go to our YouTube page, you'll see many of them archived from the, you know, our very first virtual program, which was with our Rising Tides artists up until recent ones as well. Those have been really fun to put together. And we also tried to think of ways that we could bring art into the community for those that were you know, still not comfortable coming inside our doors once we were able to reopen in the summer. And so we um, initiated this project, which we called Paint Detown, where we had some iconic works for our collection reproduced and um, 
displayed throughout uh, the Doylestown area. So people, you know, who might rather be outside than inside at that moment uh, could still see some of our artworks and, and um, we could still be a part of the community. And we also, of course, wanted to make sure that our staff and visitors are safe. So this is during install of Rising Tides when we were finally allowed to come back in the galleries and prepare for this exhibition to open. And you can see um, this, uh, an artist, Margarita Hagen, who uh, makes this beautiful ceramic work that you see on the tables and on the pedestals. Um, she's masked, um, kind of trying to stay distance from our preparators, Nick and Francis, who are working on the lift to install um, her really amazing um, installation that she had in that exhibition. And we also wanted to make sure our visitors knew what they were expecting when they did come back. So this is a, a still from a video that we put together prior to our opening um, to explain our, you know, reopening policies, um, ways, you know, ways that we were in, enforcing social distancing and mask wearing and time ticketing and things like that. And also giving a sneak peek of as to what visitors could see when they finally did come inside the galleries. And finally, it's just, it's not all, of course, about the coronavirus this past year. So in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and countless others, and the protests for social justice that followed this past spring and summer, um, museum staff, you know, have been really thinking about how the Michener can become a more diverse and inclusive place. And we recognize that we have a lot of work to do in that regard. Um, in terms of my purview as a curator, I've been thinking a lot about our art collection, um, which is predominantly white and male. Uh, most of our Pennsylvania Impressionist paintings, for example, are by white male artists, um, although some women. Um, but we've tried to make conscious efforts to feature art artists of color within our galleries. Uh, we were thrilled to have an exhibition of work by Sid Carpenter this year. It was in the works pre-pandemic, but you can see some of her sculptures on the left. She's a ceramicist at uh, Swarthmore College, and she creates these monumental ceramic and steel sculptures that are portraits of African-American owned farms and gardens in the South. Um, and I love the idea of having these on display among, you know, nearby our, our more, you know, impressionist landscape paintings, because they pre present a very different perspective of land and land ownership. And um, also when we were putting together our photography exhibition that's up now through the lens, Modern Photography in the Delaware Valley, we, we were pulling primarily from our permanent collection and we realized very quickly that most of the artists and our photographers in our permanent collection are white. So as a result, we went and borrowed work from artists like Maria Dunlau, Ada Trio, William Williams and Donald Camp, who's two um, you know, really captivating portraits you see there on the right. The one on the right is of course, John Lewis. Um, so we borrowed this work to help address this lacuna within the exhibition and present a more representat rep excuse me, representative survey of local photography from the region. And we're also working to acquire work by all of these artists for our permanent collection. So we can you know, have, present a more diverse view. And like I said, representative view of art in the region. And these are very small steps we recognize and there's a lot of work to be done, but I know um, our staff is committed to making changes that um, will, will help uh, you know, everyone feel like they have a place at the Michener. So that concludes my kind of brief presentation on museum life uh, in 2020. So I'm going to, am I turning it over to Ruben? I'm gonna turn it over to Ruben. All right. Um, so I have one page that I will share. If you just bear with me, I'm bringing it up here. So, uh, can you guys see the main screen, Matt? It, we can see it, but you have to do this thing that we we can see oh, your okay. notes too. Let me swap it out again. Great. Perfect. Right. So I was asked to sort of speak about um, you know what I've been doing since the pandemic hit, and I think you know initially people tend to think that once the pandemic hit, everything came to a screeching halt, and uh, most of us that had activities going on, we just kind of put them on the shelf. However, um, you know, we, we just got a different type of busy, right? And I think through my work with the uh, African American Museum of Bucks County, uh, where I think during my intro, uh, it was mentioned that I had been working with various schools within the 
the Bucks County school system and Trenton city school system, we had a, uh, a pop-up museum uh, that really had four stations, um, you know, that talked about Africa, the motherland, the middle passages, the underground railroad, and then, you know, the civil rights era. And then we really finished off with what we call the hidden figures of Bucks County, which uh, we highlighted uh, people like Thelma Burke, uh, Selma Burke, excuse me, uh, Lenny Miller, who was the first African-American uh, owner of a race car, uh, Judge Clyde Waite, who is still living and with us, uh, who was the first uh, African-American judge in Bucks County. So we had a lot of pop-up activities that we were going from school to school and essentially bringing the museum uh, to, to, uh, to, to those that participated in it. But when the pandemic hit, obviously we weren't able to get into the schools. Schools were shut down and we shifted our work uh, in a different way to the community. And uh, I, I designed and worked with our area grocery store chains and many of uh, the church organizations that understood that there were people in our community that just couldn't put food on the table. And we had a pandemic relief program where we fed, uh, we provided groceries uh, on a weekly basis, uh, on a monthly basis to uh, close to 100 families um, up and down the Bucks County area, all the way up through Doylestown, people would come down and get packaged foods that, uh, uh, that we were creating. We also had gift cards donated by various uh, grocery store chains that were included in those packages. So we were able to get busy doing still the work in the community, but in a different way, understanding the needs of the community. Um, then, you know, George Floyd hit and, uh, and I still work. I, I work for a company called Suez uh, Corporation. And I realized that there was a need to really force the conversation on racism. Um, and the first thing that I did, because I understood that I have two sons and uh, some of the conversations that I have with my sons are not uh, traditional conversations that most people have with their children. For instance, throughout the pandemic, when schools were closed and my son was taking classes online, he decided he was going to go back up to school and spend a weekend with his friends. And the conversation that I had with him wasn't about, hey, make sure you're not out there drinking or doing anything that we don't um, approve of from a value system in our family. But the conversation shifted to more of, hey, I need you to make sure that if you're pulled over on the turnpike, on your way up, you know, pull over, put on your hazards, hands up, turn into, turn on the inside lights, roll down your window and speak very respectfully to the officer that pulls you over. And folks didn't realize that as a black man, these are the conversations that we have with our children and uh, especially our young men. Um, so as I reflected on that, I actually wrote a piece uh, for, and I posted it on our social, internal social media intranet within our job environment called Eight Minutes as a Black Man. As you, and it was a personal reflection of me being pulled over on my way to move into my college dorm um, where I felt you know, the officer was, was, was not um, friendly to me. And because of an unpaid ticket, you know, he took the law into the extremes and you know, uh, 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 impounded my vehicle, arrested me, and this all happened in upstate New York uh, in the early 90s. And I realized, you know, the folks that look at me and interact with me at work, they need to realize that this doesn't happen to someone that's just, you know, passing bad checks in a community or someone who is down and out on their luck. This happens to the individual that has the office right next door to you in, in corporate America. So, um, that, that personal reflection really uh, started a conversation within my corporate environment where we then had a series of round tables with our CEOs, various allies, um, and, and now it's being spread globally uh, within our company. And it led to us having a list of nine commitments. I also head up, uh, co-chair the affinity group within uh, my company uh, where uh, for African-Americans, it's called the African-American Forum. 
And we came up with a list of nine commitments that we said, you know what, um, as a company, we need to be more respectful and we need to have some things in place that shows that the company understands the time and the days that we're in. And, um, you know, we ended up having uh, a list of nine items to help attract, retain, and promote black and brown talent, which included things like uh, recruitment at historically black colleges and universities, focus people reviews to make sure that, you know, blacks and black and brown employees are being considered for uh, promotional opportunities and so forth. So, you know, lastly, those conversations led to a greater awareness within our HR environment of some policies that needed to be changed. And it provided us to get some budgeting for training and so forth within that environment as well. So um, as I mentioned, it's a different type of busy, uh, but all worthwhile. And lastly, uh, about a month ago, uh, we partnered with the YWCA and United Way of doing a simulation on the US policy contributions to the racial wealth gap that uh, many of us often think, well, you know, what happened? And we don't realize that policy is at the, at the end of it. This is what drove the reason for us having such a wealth gap between blacks and whites in our country and, uh, and the contributions to it. So it was a tremendous learning experience for a lot of people. And then uh, fortunately, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, start writing a book that I called uh, The Generational Blueprint. And you know, the research theory behind it, it suggests that we're all born into one of five generational blueprints and teaches how to plan the move from one to the next level of achievement with the ultimate goal of really achieving the highest level of that blueprint. So, um, so the book is probably about 80% written and um, I'm really excited about the, uh, the, the data and the information that it provides in it. So looking forward to having it published and you know, having more and more conversations with different organizations and young people about really what blueprint they were born in and how they can move to the next. And then my ultimate favorite thing that I've done <laughs> uh, was really you know, being invited to be a part of, a, of the jury, uh, being the juror on this essential work project. I tell you the photographs that uh, have been submitted were just heart moving and just inspirational. And uh, it really captured the essence of what was truly important as the entire country went through that period. So that's a little bit of what I've done in the last year and uh, looking forward to doing more. Love the collaboration with Marlene and Laura and Matt. So hopefully there'll be an opportunity to do more of that in the future. So, thanks, Matt. I guess I'll hand it back to you, Laura, or to you, Matt. Oh, thank you, Ruben. Let's he, next. I want to hear from Marlene. All right. Uh, awesome. Well, quickly, so, Ruben, can you uh, unshare? Stop sharing your screen here. <laughs> there yes. we go. Perfect. Thank you, Ruben. Sorry. Cool. Uh, all right. Now it says it's disabled screen sharing. You gotta. Oh, I'll do it for you. Okay, give me one second here. That's all right. <sighs> okay. Try now, Marlene. There we go. There we go. All right. Well, I have some highlights of last year. I was asked to talk about what have you done in 2020 that was part of that I deemed as essential or part of the essential work of our community in Bucks County. So I thought I would start off with one thing that happened in 2020, right before the pandemic is happened at the Michener, thanks to Matt being just a totally amazing human being and super fun person to do everything with, is that we had a prom at the Michener. So this beautiful picture is from the queer prom. It was called Love is Love, a queer prom for all. We had 57 schools represented, 160 different youth from 57 different schools came together for what many of them still describe as the best night of their lives. So this was for LGBTQ plus youth and allies. And we just had an absolutely amazing time. And it was a tremendously 
generous and meaningful gift from the Michener to these youth uh, and to the Rainbow Room. Uh, so there's there's a shot there of them rocking out. And uh, this is a shot that happened just a week before that, also at the Michener, um, because I didn't have uh, consent from the youth, a couple of them that are in that picture, their parents do not know that they are members of the LGBTQ community. I put a cool filter on it so that you, you know, to, to make it, uh, but there they are being led through the galleries uh, for, our, for a private gallery tour. Um, and it is still weird to me to see people without masks so close together. Uh, and there's some of the, one of the keepsakes from the prom. And so we quickly pivoted as soon as uh, the pandemic hit uh, the Rainbow Room, which is one of the most important things that I've frankly ever done in my life. Uh, I was part of working with a group of students 19 years ago when we opened in Doylestown and we didn't even miss a week of meeting. We just totally pivoted our energy and we've been online ever since. So every Wednesday night, uh, we get together uh, for education, advocacy and connection and friendship. So this is an example of one of our Instagram announcements about an art night that we had. Um, and also it's just a super cute picture. Um, something else that's been an essential part of 2020 and the last year for me has been uh, amplifying and, and increasing my participation with the movement for black lives. Um, and that is a yard sign that uh, it is the third one that we have had at our house over the last seven years. Uh, they keep getting stolen and we have a whole bunch more of them in our garage. So uh, every time they get stolen, I make another donation to uh, the Movement for Black Lives and to the NAACP. And that's my cute partner who's also on this call. So there we are. That was in Newtown uh, or actually in Yardley. We had a vigil very soon after George Floyd's murder and we had 10,000 people that drove through. It was this really creative collaborative thing we did at the Garden of Reflection and the turnout was absolutely incredible. I actually know a few folks on this that are in this, uh, that are together here in this group tonight who were there. Some people waited two, three hours to drive through and, and be part of it. It was really uh, a, an important moment in our community. And, uh, and another thing I helped do was you know, uplift and use my white privilege to gain access and resources for other communities. This is in Morrisville um, for a Black Lives Matter rally there uh, where we were confronted with uh, really toxic, dangerous armed counter protesters. Um, and we, you know, held, held our space and our energy as, you know, peaceful warriors for beloved community. And, uh, and this is in Doylestown. Uh, so this is another uh, of one of probably 25 Black Lives Matter demonstrations that happened this year in Doylestown, the county seat of Bucks County, as most of you probably know. And that's me standing in back uh, of Morris Derry, an activist and member of our community. Uh, these are peacekeepers that are linking arms. We actually physically, you know, put our bodies between um, not in this moment, but um, when Morris was being, you know, stand, when we were standing in front of him between him and armed uh, so-called Blue Lives Matter demonstrators that were, that, that walked down to confront us. Uh, probably one of the scariest uh, days of my life being there and seeing, um, you know, people with weapons on, uh, on their, on their hips, they're yelling at black teenagers, you know, grown men, pretty disturbing. Thing to see. This was an inspiring moment. This is the first time in the history of Bucks County that the county courthouse raised the pride flag for June, which was Pride Month. And there we are with masks. The youth were doing it. Uh, I was reading a little um, reading that we put together in honor of it. And super meaningful to have these young people. First of all, this moment, I hadn't seen some of them in three months um, because of the, the quarantine and because of COVID. But uh, that and that flag there was gifted to the Rainbow Room from our Lieutenant Governor uh, John Fetterman. It, used, it, it was hanging in the Capitol building and then was given to us to honor the prom. So 
Uh, and there, there I am with some of the youth from the Rainbow Room uh, at another Pride event um, where we were asked to carry the banner leading that, leading that event. And, uh, and this was uh, there at the county courthouse. Um, that's me with my peacekeeper vest on, one of the important roles. And what is actually really essential is helping to keep the peace and collaborating with our local police department to keep demonstrations and people's First Amendment rights protected, um, all, regardless of what their voice is. Uh, and of course, always honoring the safety and the public the public health situation that we are that we are in. I am a proud daughter of a public health nurse, uh, and take that very seriously. And this was um, a picture that was picked up by the AP, <laughs> and in uh, this was when um, now President Biden and uh, Dr. Biden were in Bristol, and uh, and I was thrilled to get an invitation to be able to be there, and. Uh, and be near the stage uh, hearing them speak. And, uh, and you know, one of many vigils uh, and events at uh, also, this one is honoring uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg after her death. And uh, so that's in Doylestown and still finding out, you know, figuring out how to be socially distant, how to be safe, uh, even though we know there was very, you know, very little, um, contraction of COVID from public events like this with people with masks on, it still is a priority. And I'm in a high, you know, high risk group myself. So I take that very seriously. Another example and something that I learned about a lot last year was the concept of mutual aid. And this was specifically a mutual aid initiative when we found out there was a, I mean, there are many of them, but this is what one of our local immigrant families, one of our Latinx, uh, Latina families uh, who ha had previously escaped an ICE raid in our community and uh, because of not having documentation. And the older two people in the family were restricting their meals in order to make sure there was enough food daily for the younger two. And when some of us found this out, we organized to help them through those first several months of COVID in covering their rent and getting them food. And there's a lot of that that happened. And some of the images in the slideshow and the photographs that, uh, that people submitted also really reflect that generosity that happened, uh, which was a very, very essential part of our community, uh, especially when those supports couldn't always be relied on from uh, the federal government. And this was a really sweet moment when school started back up again in uh, September. Uh, and there was a lot of uh, a lot of anger and judgment that was placed on teachers and on the district about, you know, on all kinds of, on districts all over the place about decisions of being virtual or in person or hybrid. And so the students from a group called Youth for Unity organized to go to, to rotate around to some of the schools in Central Bucks and leave welcoming messages for the staff and teachers for their, and the students weren't even in the classroom, but they spent hours, uh, leaving loving messages, welcoming them back and thanking them for their hard work. So there's some uh, examples there. This just happened on Sunday. So this was, um, and even though we are smiling, this was a very somber event. This was an event led again, exclusively organized by students for um, to, to share the stories of some victims of sexual assault who are teenage girls and sharing their recent stories of things that have happened. So there's a lot that gets put on hold during a pandemic, but violence and racism and uh, misogyny uh, are not put on hold in any way. And in fact, many of the supports and places that people think of going to are sometimes harder to access, um, which is one of the reasons why the Rainbow Room has also maintained support. We have study halls now twice a week and movie nights on the weekends, like really trying to provide that support um, so this event happened on Sunday and the youth being the, you know, brilliant, flexible uh, leaders that they are immediately expanded their event after the, the brutal massacre of the Asian um, women and community members in Georgia and expanded the event to honor and remember those lives and to uplift the voices of, 
our Asian American Pacific Islander community. And one of those speakers is actually here as a participant. So hi, Sarah. Um, this is an event that's coming up next week because pandemic or not, essential to other people or not, this is what I do. So this is an incredible partnership between Youth for Unity and the Rainbow Room. And all of you are invited. It's next Wednesday, it's free. It's from six to eight o'clock and it's a, a panel of fierce, awesome, diverse women and girls uh, speaking about passion, perseverance and power. So uh, I'm gonna drop in the chat how you can find out more about that. Um, I guess the, an, another thing just to, let's see, did I have anything else? Nope, um, let me stop my screen share. Another thing to really amplify is uh, that was a hugely important part, and I was so glad to see the images in the slideshow, was the effort of getting out the vote last year and, and really helping through a, a really challenging, difficult time of doing that. And just make sure everybody knows, May 18th, another opportunity to vote. Uh, so make sure you get yourself to the polls. Um, I also want to just, you know, I recognize Sarah. I also want to recognize Kevin, uh, who's on this call, who's uh, one of the leaders of the Bucks County Anti-Racism Coalition. So even though this year has been devastating in so many ways, including with tragedies and you know horrific things that have happened and just in the last week, obviously, around the country, seven mass shootings in seven days and countless um, you know, tragedy, I have also made some of the most incredible friendships and connections and deepened some. Um, I'm thankful for some of the strange apps that I'm now using on my phone to chat with people and connect. Uh, it's like a, just a very different way of being in the world. And uh, so I really wanted to uplift that. And uh, and then, you know, in addition to just the strange space of scaling back one's social life and something that I know has impacted all of us. Um, I was reading a quote today um, that is very meaningful to me from Cornell West, which is that justice is what love looks like in public and tenderness is what love looks like in private. So to me, love is an essential part of who we are in this community, a very much an essential part of art and creativity and certainly something that the Michener upholds. And that was expressed so deeply in the images that, uh, that were submitted. So that's all I got to say, but I'll put some, some links in the chat or if anybody has any questions, um, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Laura. Uh, all important work and uh, so moving and touching for you to all share that um, with us tonight. Uh, but now I want us to have a chance for our jurors to actually share some of the work that's in the exhibition. And I think it'll be very clear uh, soon how everything all three of the jurors have talked about are sort of in this exhibition. So I'm going to turn it back over to Laura, who's going to lead us through looking at some of these exhibitions and I, uh, some of these photos. And I will say that uh, I know we have some of the artists on this event. Mm -hmm. So if uh, you're, if we show one of your photographs and you're here, um, I would like to, uh, if you have something to say and you would like to say something, I would like to give space for um, you to unmute yourself and say whatever you would like to say about um, your photo. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Laura. Thanks. And yeah, I just want to echo um, Matt's, you know, thank you to Ruben and Marlene for all the amazing work you've done in the community this past year. It's, uh, it's really remarkable and um, I, lives depend on it really. So that's, that's really impressive. Um, I, I just wanted to, to note um, that we haven't included all of the photographs from all the finalists um, in the slideshow that we, we loved, of course, all of them because we selected them and um, had great conversations around all of them. We just don't fortunately have the time to talk about all of the images. Um, so we, we just, we selected, I think about 10 uh, today to discuss a little further. Um, and I also just wanted to provide kind of some background as to what, in terms of what we were looking for, or how we were selecting these images. Um, and of course, you know, the image quality was, was a factor. We were looking for kind of good captivating images, uh, but we were also looking um, for images that presented what, what I was calling a, a diversity of vision. So we were looking for different subject matter that provided kind of a, like a range of responses, uh, creative responses to the call. 
and also ones that just really grabbed us. I think I think both Ruben and Marlene would agree with that. You know, ones that really resonated with us on different levels, um, or you know, that shared kind of a, a moment that was unexpected and, and very powerful. And, um, so we can start um, with this image, Tenderness in 2020 by Sean Reed, which was one that I think we all selected as one of our top images. And it was also selected by the Philadelphia Inquirer photo editors as their top pick of the exhibition. They, they reviewed the 25 finalists and selected their top three images as well, which is noted in the exhibition. Ruben, did you wanna say something about this image? Yeah, I, I just thought this was um, one of the most moving uh, photos um, that were submitted. It just it just speaks to our heart and, and just takes you to a place of wondering if this woman just lost a loved one, a job, or some other difficulty in her life. And and throughout this pandemic, I think we most of us can only count on probably you know five, on one hand how many times we actually hugged someone other than our immediate family. So this one was just touching me, just uh, mm -hmm. reflecting on that on that fact that, man, we, we just didn't hug too many people in the last year. So it was uh, particularly moving for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so this was taken during a protest in support for a homeless house uh, this past summer. And I, I believe Ilya is on um, on the call, so she wants to jump in too. But I, I, I really love this one because it just shows how um, artists and art uh, were, were very much a part of our, you know, we're, respo we're responding to this moment in very powerful ways. And to me, you know, of course, working at an art museum, art is essential to me. And um, I think several of the images that we received also echoed that, that art can be a tool for change and for social justice um, and be a way to uh, amplify voices and um, make the case for or change. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, yeah. great. Hi, Elia. Hi, Laura. It's just, it's great to see everybody's work, not just in these photographs, but your presentations as jurors. I mean, it, it really does take all of us to come together in our evolved creative generosity in order to fulfill this next evolution in humanity because it's the gigs up, you know, <laughs> this it's not going on any longer. It, it's just not, it, 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 and we, we are powerful. We are more powerful than we know. And so when, when um, the tragedy of George Floyd happened, I, I immediately made a huge poster, like five feet by four feet, and it was like a wind sail. And I went out and I protested everywhere I could. And I got so much response from it for people really felt connected to that portrait. It's not this one here, it's another one. Actually, it's in the foreground. And and uh, they wanted photographs with it. And I thought, God, this is so, this is interesting. You know, it's almost as though there is a, a homage to the, the um, the life of this man through this portrait, almost like an Egyptian tomb portrait or something, you know, and it seemed to carry some weight with everyone that was at these protests. And I, I was getting yanked around to get photographs. People asked me to take photographs in front of the poster of their of them and their kids and stuff. So I thought, what can I do? And I I drove home from Easton and I said, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start an, an, a, a, an economy of <laughs> justice that's going to be based on um, painting posters and giving them out for free to whoever wants them and they can donate what they want. And that money will then go back into their community to the Boys and Girls Club or the Philly Bail Fund, there were a number of different, um, I, this all happened within like 12 hours. <laughs> and it all, all the doors opened. The mayor said yes, the police said yes, everybody was like, because open carry in Pennsylvania is really dicey, you know, I mean, it really is. I, um, as Marlene was saying, you know, you can, there can be some difficult situations. But that said, I was just surrounded by light and, and I think I um, produced about 45 uh, posters and I wrote sayings on the back whatever the people w wanted and I collected almost two thousand dollars for these various um, clubs and or you know different charities and 
mostly for the children, you know, just, just to see how does this economy work? If I say I do for, I'm going to do this step forward, how does this work to put the money back into the community to support the very people that are wanting the justice? You know, So it, 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 uh, it always a nice, uh, nice and nothing was nice about it, except for that this, that cycle proved itself to be very, um, uh, beautiful and honorable and people really stepped up to the plate um, to make it work. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing, Elia. Another, another one, this, this is showing um, nurses at a hospital in Abington that are having a moment of silence for for George Floyd and, and during kind of during the moments of protest. Yeah, I, I thought this one was uh, particularly moving as well. I often hear growing up right, that everyone remembers when certain pivotal moments in our lives happen. Uh, the assassination of JFK, 9-11, and then certainly now the pandemic kickoff where you were when sort of our world got shut down, right? And flights ceased to happen. And, you know, I, I know I was at a baseball tournament in South Carolina and had to, in the middle of my son's baseball game, everything shut down. And they said, all right, the season's over. You know, you got to get back to school, pack up and find your way home. Um, so, you know, this was really the true essence of, of, of that moment in our lifetime as we were out celebrating you know, the medical industry and all of their contributions related to COVID-19, these were still nurses that took the time for a moment of silence for someone else other than themselves. So I just thought it was, it was amazing. There's a slight look of exhaustion in their, in their faces, but still, you know, they, they, they wanted to uh, contribute to the, uh, to the moment that was happening in our world as well. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this was a particularly moving one. Marlene, did you want to say something? Yeah, and the the story that went with this one was also incredibly moving of the gratitude for the hospice uh, worker that helped to bring this person's mother and father together. And this was the last moment. This was really a goodbye holding of hands and um, and within, I think, a few weeks, both of these, um, both of this person's parents had died from COVID. And I believe it was from COVID. And I, I have a photo that's very similar of my parents' hands um, from many years ago. And it really touched me deeply. And, uh, and just knowing how hard it was for this moment to happen because of both some restrictions, there was definitely some anger expressed in the artists, uh, in the photographer's statement of like the kind of the in feeling of like desperation and, and injustice of, of allowing these two beloveds to say goodbye to each other. Um, so it's really, there were several beautiful photos of people connecting in this way of people reading, someone reading to an elderly person, a 90, someone's 94th birthday mm -hmm. and having seen the candles on the cake, but the family was on the outside of glass windows with all the staff, again, to Ruben's point of the dedicated staff who in that image are mostly people of color and the you know family members outside of the window are mostly white, like all the different ways that the this pandemic and dynamics of, of access and race and, and, and love um, have woven together. So that was, that was sort of what, yeah, look at that. That's the hands have played a large role in the communications of emotions. That's so true. Mm -hmm. Finding, finding ways to connect in a, in a moment where it's, it's challenging and difficult to do so. I think that's a theme that kind of went across several images um, in the exhibition. Uh, and, I, and Heidi, I believe, is on is on this call too. Um, but I and I also I had the 
pleasure of meeting Heidi in the exhibition on Thursday when we opened for the preview. So that was really fun. But this this really um, spoke to me as a parent of young children and trying to juggle, you know, education and working and all all that other stuff <laughs> during the during the pandemic. And I um, I love the the description that Heidi wrote about this pod that she um, helped set up um, with, um, you know, all these kindergartners. Um, as you know, she described all the things that they were doing and she said, and every Wednesday we smash the patriarchy. <laughs> so I love that part, of course. And Heidi, if you want to chime in with anything, feel free to do so, but you don't have to, if you don't want to. She also recorded an audio component that's in the exhibition too. So you can listen to her talk about this image. I'd love to hear the other judges, um, uh, kind of thoughts also on this picture. I saw the exhibit and it was so moving. Each, some of the pictures were just so powerful depicting 2020 and mine in comparison felt so almost lighthearted. <laughs> um, because honestly, this is the best thing I've ever done for my child and for these children. And it's a big gift for me to be able to have that much um, power and influence on what my child is learning. And yes, every Wednesday we smash the patriarchy. <laughs> and, you know, we, we talk about diversity and inclusion. We don't shy away from, um, from any topics. And actually in the picture toward the back, um, there's a poster that says count every vote because we talked about um you know what very much about the 2020 election um and uh the kids are just so engaged it's 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 been the, a wonderful side effect of the pandemic um so I, I wanted to hear what others had to say and thank you so much for including me. I, I did just wanna add that I, I think, you know, that what you just described is of course essential work, right? Educating our kids and educating them in this, you know, meaningful uh, way that's engaged with our current events. I don't think, I think we all, I don't wanna speak for Ruben and Marlene, but I think we all agree that essential work doesn't have to be, you know, um, healthcare or, you know, these kind these, what we think is more perhaps tragic or, um, you know, um, or sad, you know, I, I, there can be joy in it too. Um, and I think your photo really captured that um, for us as well. Yeah, I would definitely say like this photo is seriously essential work and finding ways to inspire and educate. I mean, my gosh, like to me, this is I, I hear what you're saying. It's also sort of like the primary colors of like a little, you know, a little elementary age pod um, or maybe a little younger than elementary, but it's so vital. And also we, we immediately noticed the count every vote. When we were looking at the hundred or so images, we wanted to make sure that there was imagery that was both captivating, but also that reflected the election efforts, because that was a huge part of last year. And the fact that it was there looking like it was written maybe by a child um, next to a, you know, what at least appears to me to be a painting or a, you know, a like a color, a coloring page of um, of our vice president is, is pretty incredible. I mean, my gosh, just seeing the, like, you know, when you look at it, you know what's happening. You know, this is like kids with masks separated in someone's home in this new world where we are figuring out how to how to take care of one another and also how to learn and and i think that joy you know the joy that's all like that the the brightness of it is such an important part of our survival and our resistance is the joy and the love and the you know the a lot of the images were really kind of heavier but some were playful and get to look at some of them
All right, this was, I, I believe this is one of mine. So, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll go to, I'm, I'm a big TV buff of, of certain shows. And, you know, this one just reminded me of an episode of Monk where uh, there was a garbage or a sanitation worker strike and they went on strike and it just made me wonder, you know, what that would have done to compound the, the, the pandemic in our lives if all of a sudden, you know, the trash people weren't considered uh, essential workers. So I, I just thought, you know, here's a man, you know, fully masked, uh, gloved up and everything else. And, uh, you know, just doing work that, that we really consider to be important in our community. So I, I, I love this photograph and I thought it spoke volumes. Um, uh, you know, to, to what we were experiencing. So if, you, if you've never seen that episode, and as you know, Monk is a peculiar guy anyway, but uh, check out that episode. It'll, it'll make you laugh, but also think deeply about what an essential worker is. This also reminded me of some of those moments at the beginning where we made, we colored in thank you signs and put them on our recycling and trash bin and you know, we always do a little thing around the holiday, the winter holidays for the delivery people. But we were like, how can we do like, how can we do more? And also we're just stuck in this house. So what can we do? And I, I love that you uplifted this image, Ruben. So I, I was, I, you know, we were each asked to pick like a little handful and we had a lot of overlap, uh, which made a lot of sense. And this is one that I picked. Um, I, I love the way that this, that it's Max, that, that the photographer captured this image with the, the movement and the feet off the pavement and the cop looking at his phone. And there's some parts of this that could have been like some aspects of this photo that looked like it was 50 years old, but of course that, you know, it has 2020, um, but I see no justice, like just that as a representation of, um, of this moment and the juxtaposition of this white, very white girl at the front, the cop, the black, you know, youth in the, in the, on the sides there, the young men. Um, so i this was inspiring and 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 something also about the police officer um you know speaking into his walkie-talkie but it kind of looks i mean he's just like right in the crowd like you kind of there's a whole story here that isn't completely obvious so that was were my thoughts on this one yeah we selected a number of um, protest photographs for the exhibition too and then there were all they're all different too and, and different perspectives i like this i like do like how this one is like the, the protesters are coming right towards you we have a, a few more that are in the exhibition where you see the protesters from behind um but there's this kind of power in them and them almost like staring you down and you know and, and challenging you uh, to take action So I had identified this one as well. I just love even the title of it, like enfranchisement. It's not, I often just hear disenfranchisement, but it's like, this is enfranchising people. And I, uh, and the way he is looking at the camera, like the intensity of his eyes, the absolute critical nature of the black vote uh, last year. Um, and, you know, now gosh, looking at the attack on voting rights is, the, what's hap what's that's going to be a big part of our future right now and for this year um so you know and you like you got your phone and you you've got your clipboard or maybe it's an ipad and you know out getting the word out Uh, I chose this one for, for our presentation today uh, by Taylor Ecker, Quarantine Creatives. And um, I just, I loved how, uh, so this is um, 
Chris Dietz and his mom, Shirley, and they're um, playing music together, you know, through their door, I imagine, to people passing by, um, which is something that I saw in, in you know, my community um, as well. But this idea of kind of bringing joy, uh, bringing music, bringing art um, into the community, even when we have to keep distant, um, I thought was a really sort of, you know, wonderful, uh, joyful photograph. I like the joyful ones, apparently. <laughs> Um, so it just, it just made me happy. It's the art in you. <laughs> it's the art, yeah. <laughs> All right, I, I think this was, uh, and, and, and I'll relate it back to another television show, right? So growing up, I loved and often, and still, you know, watch the, uh, the old episodes of The Twilight Zone. And, uh, it, it, you know, that, that TV show often challenged our imagination and really imagine the unthinkable by challenging our idea of what, you know, we currently consider to be normal. Like, for instance, right, how, how many of us would have ever imagined growing up, and I grew up in New York City, knowing and seeing Times Square completely empty, right? You would never imagine that, right? So, you know, obviously at the time before the vaccine existed, my imagination just took me to this place where I, 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 I was thinking, you know, what if we found out that the traditional masks that we were wearing were ineffective and we now had to live in a world where we all now live, you know, behind gas masks. So this is kind of where that photo took me in. And, and I thought it was uh, just interesting to take a look at and see, you know, what, what things would look like in the future if we didn't as, as a human race, just come together and actually find a solution for this uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, virus. So, um, I, and I love the fact that it was black and white, kind of adds a little bit of spookiness to it. <laughs> so uh, I really enjoyed this one. I'll also jump in here. And uh, I actually, Hannah is one of the artists we got to spoke to for some of the um, audio tours that's a part of the exhibition. And uh, this was a really fascinating one to learn more about. Hannah's a student in Philadelphia, a photography student. This was part of a project that she just had to be working on when the pandemic hit. So it's a, a really uh, coincidental, bizarre, but poignant image that um, if you want to learn more about, I would highly suggest when you go to the show, look at those and listen to those um, artist statements because um, she talks a little bit about this, this photograph. Cool. And I got to meet her when I was there at the show and she, that was super cool. Thank you, Laura, for making that introduction. And I just love that there was one that is truly like, like a, you know, a choreographed piece of art. And she used to babysit for this family. So she was their nanny. So she's very close with all of them and they were all totally into it. She had several in this, several, uh, one of them all like in a tree and, um, and just the, the, locating of these masks and doing this totally ordinary sort of lovely activity but in this with this dooms filled kind of costume on yeah that was that was really really amazing sorry that is the end of the all the right. end of the ones that we chose, and I know I'm, I'm, I know we didn't, like I said, we didn't include all of them from the exhibition. Although you know we certainly have something to say, would have something to say about all of them. Um, I know we're over time by now, right? <laughs> yeah. So we've come to come and past our uh, time limit for tonight, but I think we have uh, covered a lot of the ground. I hope this has inspired, if you haven't already to go see this amazing exhibition for yourselves. Um, I wanna take a moment to uh, remind everyone if you uh, want to watch this program again or know someone who couldn't be here tonight, I wanna send this to them. Uh, the link will be public on our YouTube page in the next few days. Uh, I wanna remind everyone also that uh, if you enjoyed this program, uh, please invite your friends, your family, everyone you know, uh, to attend our other programs. We have a lot of great virtual and soon in-person programs at the museum. Lastly, I want to thank uh, everyone who attended tonight. Thank you again. Your support means a great deal to the museum. Uh, and then I want to thank Ruben, Marlene, and Laura.
thank you so much for your time, energy, and amazing thoughts uh, about this exhibition. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. And I hope you all see the show if you haven't already. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Michener Art Museum. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Really all right, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank please, you. Everyone stay safe. Stay healthy. And remember, stay arty, everyone. We'll see you later. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>